What does it take to write a book that stands the test of time? Way back in the late 1700s, Jane Austen managed to write multiple books that are still read and loved to this day, and they constantly inspire modern day retellings. So what is it about her writing that over 200 years later, readers still love? I believe it comes down to two things, and they show up in both her life and her writing. But before we can even talk about Jane Austen, we have to talk about George and Cassandra, her parents. George Austen was born in 1731 to very wealthy wool merchants, but he was orphaned at nine years old and ended up living with his uncle. He was well taken care of, but by the time he was an adult, all the family money had gone to his other siblings and he had fallen into poverty. When he was 16, he went to St. John's College in Oxford, and this is where he met Cassandra Lay. Cassandra Lay was from a prominent family, and even though her male relatives would get the bulk of the inheritance, she would receive a modest sum from her wealthy family. So long before Jane was born, there was a marriage in her family that had financial hardship attached to it, but it was her father marrying into a wealthy family of her mother, not the other way around. And I just have to stop here and point out that when George and Cassandra got engaged, they exchanged miniatures which were these tiny self-portraits that I think has to be one of the most romantic things ever because in this age, you couldn't just look at pictures of the one that you love. So having a little picture keepsake was a big deal. So that's just super romantic and I love it. So here we are, George married into the wealthy Lay family to ensure that there was a bit of money that would come in eventually. And this was super helpful because he was a rector at Anglican churches of his towns of Steventon and Dean, which means he was basically just a church administrator and he didn't make very much money. He often supplemented it by farming or taking in kids and teaching them. But they started having kids. They ended up having eight in total. And Jane was the sixth, born in 1775. Now, all reports say that the household was a happy one. And as Jane grew up, she became closest to her older sister, Cassandra, who was named after her mother. And two things punctuated Jane's young life, which was lots of reading and lots of writing. First of all, she was allowed to read any books from both her father's library and a neighbor's library, which was pretty rare in those days, especially for girls. And by 11 years old, she was already writing, and her father, even with his modest income and him working at the church, ensured she had the nicest paper and ink to practice on. And according to Janet Todd, a modern-day British academic and author who wrote extensively about Jane Austen, these early writings of Jane's were, quote, stories full of anarchic fantasies of female power, license, illicit behavior, and general high spirits. And here's the crazy thing. Her dad encouraged all of this, even in this time when writing by females at all wasn't highly encouraged, especially this kind of crazy writing. It's amazing that her father did encourage this, and it's probably a big reason we have any of the stories from Jane to this day. In early 1785, when she was nine years old, she attended a boarding school for girls, but because her father couldn't afford the tuition, she ended up coming back home in December of 1786 when she was 11 years old. And from that time on, she never really left her hometown again. She lived in that town until the day she died, 30 years later. As she grew up, that satire and cutting wit were always a part of her in both her personal life and her writing. In fact, later in her life, her sister Cassandra burned most of Jane's letters, so, quote, her younger nieces did not read any of Jane's sometimes acid or forthright comments on neighbors or family members. But a big turning point came for Jane Austen in December of 1795, right when she was turning 20 years old. A 19-year-old Irish boy named Tom Lefroy visited her hometown of Steventon, and they started a courtship and very quickly fell in love. She wrote a letter to her sister insinuating that she was expecting a proposal. But just two months into this courtship, Lefroy's family intervened, sent him off to London to study as a barrister, where he would later become a member of Parliament for the United Kingdom. Jane must have been heartbroken. We know she was still thinking of him three years later because she had tea with one of his relatives and desperately wanted to ask after Tom, but couldn't bring herself to do it. From then on, Jane never had a serious relationship with a man ever again. She did at one point accept an offer of proposal, but he was a horrible man. And she was only thinking of the security it would provide her and her family. But within 24 hours, she had withdrawn her acceptance of his proposal. So here's what a lot of people don't know. It was that year that Tom Lefroy was taken from her and sent to London that she began work on the book that would become Pride and Prejudice. 
She finished the first draft less than a year later when she was just 21 years old. And there are two big lessons that stand out to me in Jane Austen's story. First, writers are often given the admonition to write what you know. But what exactly does that mean? Sure, there's physical things you know. If you're a plumber, it'll be easier to write a realistic story with a plumber. If you grew up in Baltimore, Maryland, you could more easily set your stories in Baltimore. But the lesson I take from Jane's story is different. It's not write about what you know physically. It's write about what you know emotionally. Write about your pain. She took growing up in a poor family with no real prospects for her marriage, having a chance at love, and then having it snatched from her, and she took that story and she turned that pain into pride and prejudice. So when you're thinking about your writing, think about what losses have you suffered? What lessons do you bear the scars of learning? And what are things that you are most afraid to talk about, especially in public? My next book is in its final edits, and it's a fictionalized version of my EMDR therapy experience. I took the pain and the suffering I experienced, and I translated it into the best writing I've ever produced. So the first lesson is to write what you know, but not just the physical stuff, not just where you live or the things you know how to do. Write about the emotional stuff too, that pain that you know better than anybody else. The second lesson I take from Jane is what is your non-negotiable. In 1814, when she was 38 years old and just three years from her death, so this is 18 years after her courtship with the only love of her life, Jane's niece reached out to her to get some advice about a serious relationship and Jane responded, quote, I shall now turn around and entreat you not to commit yourself further and not to think of accepting him unless you really do like him. Anything is to be preferred or endured rather than marrying without affection. The English scholar Douglas Bush wrote that Austin had, quote, a very high ideal of the love that should unite a husband and wife. All of her heroines know in proportion to their maturity the meaning of ardent love. When we think about the non-negotiable story grid, we're asking what is the most important thing to you? What is the hill you're willing to die on? Where do you draw a line in the sand and say here and no further? For Jane, it was love. She wanted her readers to know that love was worth sacrificing for and it wasn't worth settling for anything less. She lived this out in her own life and this is the through line of her stories and her personal life. So what is your non-negotiable in your life? Where do you say here and no further and what drives your life? When I think of Jane Austen and setting out to write something that will stand the test of time, I start plumbing the depths of my despair, searching for the hard-fought lessons I've suffered to learn, and I think about the boundaries I hold in my life, the places where I would rather die than give up ground. If Jane was brave enough to do this in her writing 250 years ago, when she was just 20 years old, maybe I can do it now. If you want to continue thinking about your non-negotiable, I have another great video where you see how great writers like J.R.R. Tolkien and George Orwell develop their own theme. That link is down in the description and it will be on your screen shortly. If you're curious about who I am, my name is Tim Grawl. I'm the CEO of StoryGrid, where we help writers build their skills, write a book, and leave a legacy. My partner, Sean Coyne, is the creator and founder of StoryGrid and a writer and editor with over 30 years of experience. You can go to storygrid.com to see all the free resources we have available and make sure you sign up for our newsletter. That's where we send out all the latest and greatest stuff. But as always, thanks for being a writer. Thanks for being a part of our community here at StoryGrid, and I'll see you next time.